A new book about Howard Wilson is called The Winner, and its author, Labour MP and Shadow International Trade Secretary, Nick Thomas Simmons, joins me in the studio. Morning, Nick. Nice Morning. to see you. Um, why Howard Wilson? That's my first question, because there were several other books about Howard Wilson. So what was it that you wanted to get across, explore, examine, discover about Howard Wilson that we perhaps didn't know before? Well, I think I'm firstly interested in Harold Wilson, as the subtitle suggests, because he won general elections. And since Clem Attlee lost power in 1951, only two Labour leaders so far have actually won general elections, Harold Wilson and Tony Blair. And no Labour leader has won as many times as Harold did. So he's fascinating in that respect. But the reason I think this is the moment uh, for this book is because there were two previous biographies of Harold written in the early 1990s by Ben Pimlott and Philip Ziegler, and perfectly fine books they were, but they were written on the information of the time. So what we have now, we have the government record at the National Archive oh, course, now yeah, that have been yeah. released. We have an unpublished autobiography that Harold literally handwrote that I've been able to use for the biography. We've got documents in the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library in the United States that weren't released until the late 1990s. So a lot of new material. But also, we are in yet another period of lengthy Labour opposition. Uh, so winning a general election is, I think, for Labour once again something we need to be seriously considering. And what did you find? Take me through the process. I'm always sort of fascinated about the process of putting together a biography where the, the, the subject is not still alive. And lots of the people, you know, in and around the time. But then you, what did you find in those records and things that you, you excited you or were new things about Harold Wilson? What you found in the records in particular were a lot of the, the private notes that Harold wrote that weren't necessarily made public. And just, just to give you an example, the, the 1975 referendum on Romania in what was then the common market... And often it said, well, Harold took a bit of a, a bit of a back seat in that. But actually, that, that... And that's because he basically let his cabinet split, but in the same way that David Cameron in did. In the same way David Cameron did, he allowed suspension of collective yes. responsibility. Yes, rose above it, yes. which basically meant the cabinet was split down the middle almost, yeah. Y yes, and, but what he did is, you look at every leaf that they went through a door. It's got Harold's name, Harold's face on it, Harold's renegotiation, but also you get to see in the records the private letters that he was writing. So th there was a, a press conference where Roy Jenkins, who was very much on the side of staying in the common market, uh, making quite critical comments at a press conference about Tony Benn, who was on the other side for coming out. And you get the a private letter from Harold almost immediately saying, will you please stop doing this because uh, you are making it more difficult for me to demote Ben after the referendum by behaving in this way. And you see lots of these notes and what you get the impression of with Harold is Harold is always somebody who is in control far more strategic than the short-term view of him might suggest it's interesting the point you make there is that these days presumably all that's happening in whatsapp and text messages and yes. all that but the fact that it had to be written down and it all goes in the archive and then you can unearth it you get a sense of what was going going through his mind Clearly, you were talking about the books that came out previously in the 90s, you know, in the run up to what was then, you know, Tony Blair and, and winning in 97. And there were lots of lots of parallels. And sometimes these things could be over egged. But of course, both Howard Wilson and Tony Blair were the leaders that shouldn't have been the yes. leaders. Their predecessors, Hugh Gates Skill in the case of Howard Wilson, uh, John Smith in the case of Tony Blair, died. And that, that, the sort of the predecessor had done a lot of work, arguably, to get the party closer to power. And they sort of came and, and you know, put rocket boosters under it. They're both completely accidental leaders, uh, both because of quite sudden and shocking deaths of their uh, predecessors. In the case of Harold Wilson, the very sudden and tragic death of Hugh Gateskill, which opened up a leadership contest, which in other circumstances wouldn't have happened. There was no suggestion that Hugh Gateskill would have been challenged before the next general mm. election. It was purely that that made it uh, possible. But the other thing that it did in both cases was it brought them in as leaders where the Conservatives had already been in power for a substantial period of time. So Harold Wilson comes, becomes Labour leader in February 1963. The Conservatives have been in power since 1951. Uh, Macmillan is still the Prime Minister at that stage, but ailing, problem, huge problems, running out of steam. So often timing is everything as well. Do you think it makes a difference, rather than becoming a leader off the back of a defeat or a challenge, 
it's sort of as a new leader to to replace a popular successful leader of the opposition who died, you know, actually put you in quite a strong place. It's not trying to pick up the pieces after a crushing election defeat or a... Is there something about those circumstances, do you think? And then actually you have a mandate. It's a sort of positive thing rather than a I'm the person best placed to clear up this mess type thing. It can be. And I think we, we can also see in those circumstances there's there's no allegation that somehow the new leader was plotting exactly. to bring the That's previous what I mean. yeah, one yeah, down. Yeah, the, the sort of fresher it's and not less there. tainted, yeah. It's not there. It's it's a leadership contest that's happened by pure accident and not by design. Uh, and clearly that does have, have an impact. And Harold uh, comes into power at that moment in February 1963. And many, you have to remember, he, he very wisely included many Gateskillites yeah. in his shadow cabinet because they were, not only did he see that in terms of party unity, but there were many people who'd been you know, extraordinarily close to Hugh Gateskill who frankly were still in a, in a real sense of shock and grief. It's interesting the, the comparison you make to uh, Macmillan. And uh, I remember interviewing Michael Cockrell a few months ago and he was making this point that, that Wilson, Macmillan really struggled with TV, uh, you know, which is the sort of the coming media, if you like. And Wilson really embraced it. You know, we could hear on the TV, on the party political broadcast, you know, his ability to connect down the sort of the camera lens and really look like he was connecting with you. And his ability to turn a phrase, and so many of the phrases that he had, we still, mm. you stay, let's take a listen. This was, this was uh, Howard Wilson uh, talking about being a big believer in technology and change. In terms of the scientific revolution, but that revolution cannot become a reality unless we are prepared to make far-reaching changes in economic and social attitudes which permeate our whole system of society. The Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution will be no place for restrictive practices or for outdated methods on either side of industry. Forged in the white heat, but that gets, still gets used all the time. Yes. Often, but I think some people don't even know where it's sort of come from. It's so part of the, of the, of the lexicon. Um, and then there was also, you know, the pipe, the famous pipe. Mm. Even though he smoked cigars in public, but he knew the pipe was a was a, a, a more appealing image in public. Yes. Was, he, was it all? Was it sort of? We think of sort of Tony Blair being the most cynical, spin obsessed pirate or ever. Was Wilson the forerunner of that? You think? I, I think that he's actually more authentic, perhaps, than that suggests. But the one thing that I think is fascinating about Harold Wilson is his adaptability, because yeah. you've just played that, that wonderful clip there, that brilliant White Heat of Technology speech from 1963. But there were also clips of him when he was the president of the Board of Trade between 1947 and 1951. And if you look at those clips uh, on the old British path, there, yeah. he's very, very stiff to look yeah. at, very it's formal, a has person. a tiny moustache, yeah. still very academic, hasn't quite developed that popular touch. But he was adaptable and he did develop that popular uh, touch. I think it was Gerald Kaufman who said about him that he almost developed a sense of humour. Yeah, because so he, he, knew, he knew there was an advantage to that. Yes, so ab he, absolutely. Yeah. And that uh, mastery of the television, he employed a very young television producer called Tony Benn, who trained him to as to what you needed to do to be effective on television. Yeah. Of course, one of the things is the quick soundbite. And how many different sound bites, you know, do we remember of things that Harold Wilson said? You know, a week is a long time in politics, uh, he said. You know, uh, commission, you know the, the royal commissions that uh, governments want to set up, they take minutes and they waste years. You know, there's so many different things that he said because he always knew that that memorable phrase yeah. was something that would really assist you in politics. I don't know over it, but of course Tony Blair then hired Peter Mandelson, a young TV <laughs> producer, who did exactly the same thing for him. And so much of the book, and it's really, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating, it's a great read. It's sort of, you know, there's lots of colour, you know, you feel like you can um, uh, really connect with all the people in it. But so much of the book is occupied with talk of inflation, industrial unrest, strikes, prices, yes. jobs. Um, uh, are we wrong to keep seeing the parallels today with the 1970s? It feels like, you know, we'll talk a bit about the, the letters of Keir Starmer, but the sort of the backdrop of, of what we're living through today is, is sort of what he was grappling with 50, 60 years ago. Well, clearly, clearly the world and the countries change, but the the dilemma that inflation presents to government is not so different yeah. from how it's presented itself to other governments in the past. And Harold, I mean, the one thing that has changed is, of course, the balance of payments in Wilson's day 
was the great thing by which an economy was measured. Quite frankly, and I, I say this too as uh, with my international trade hat on, that strong exports was seen as, a, as really incredibly important, still are incredibly yeah. important and should be today. But that balance of payment statistic, which was a monthly statistic in those days, really was looked and at. And that's, that's exports versus imports. Yes, yeah. it, it, exactly. And, and remember as well that we were still in a very different system of currency at this time, the, the sort of Bretton Woods system where the dollar is the central currency, it's pegged yeah. to the value of gold. So you have this, this constant attack on the currency and the value of the currency which is something that runs right through particularly Wilson's first government and do you think given given his his because he was off and on prime minister over such a long period and clearly he's he stepped down rather than lose mm. an election but does he bear responsibility for for having not dealt with some of those big structural economic things which actually did then herald 18 years of Tory rule it began you know we're going to be Margaret Thatcher and John Major later that not dealing with trade unions, not getting on top of inflation, uh, and actually, as the party of the trade union movement, actually, you know, did did usher in a period of Margaret Thatcher's actually pretty hardcore uh, dealing with the trade unions. The thing about this, though, is that I think we're so influenced still by the winter of 1978 and 79. Yeah. Because if you look at, uh, I mean, Jim Callaghan might might have won an election if he called in October 1978, and history might be very different. But if you look at Harold Wilson uh, and the problem of inflation in the mid-70s, you get the Yom Kippur War, you get OPEC quadrupling the, the value of a barrel of oil yeah. overnight. So you get this huge inflation that goes into the economy and everything that goes with it. But if you look at 1975, Harold had started to get inflation under control. August 75, we talk about this difficult period, How was still ahead in the polls in August 1975. And I think we tend to judge him with the hindsight. We tend to judge him. It's almost like a history won by the, written by yeah, the victor's yeah, yeah. situation because of we know what happened in the 1980s. But of course, he didn't know in 1975, 76. That's where it was going, yeah, yeah. Um, but if you look at the, the various things that he tried to do, the very interventionist approach to try and bring about solutions to strikes, or indeed the social contract, which provides not just the method by which he wanted to manage industrial relations in the 70s, but things that have stood the test of time. Things like the Health and Safety at Work Act, which is Harold Wilson. Things like the Employment Protection Act, which brought in maternity leave for the first time. You know, ACAS, the conciliation body in employment law today, still here. That's Harold Wilson yeah, yeah. again in the mid-70s. So some pretty far-reaching reforms as well and on the, on that on the sort of the on the social side there were lots of things well equality of legislation decriminalization of homosexuality uh the abolition of capital punishment race relations acts some have argued that actually he was all tactics and no strategy and that actually and actually some of those things were things that were other people's idea he was the one who sort of picked them up and ran them i mean you're clearly a fan of his so i suspect you'll say that actually that was, you know it's all credit to him that that happened How, where I mean, or was it just timing? That, that things happened and he was the one who was there to, to implement it? Well, the, the thing is, when things go wrong in government, prime ministers carry the can, yeah. right? Quite rightly, because that's where the buck stops. Yeah. But when things go right, we have to look at the prime minister of the time yeah. as well. You're allowed to take the credit for the good stuff. But, but, it's, but it's also about, I think, recognising with these things. Wilson himself was a social conservative. He had this great congregationalist background. Mm. Uh, but he did think the changes were necessary. They came about, he is the one who appointed Roy Jenkins to be Home Secretary in December 1965, knew he had a liberal reforming agenda. Things did come about, like, for example, the Abortion Act is uh, David Steele, the decriminalisation of homosexuality is, is Leo Absey. They did come about through uh, through backbenchers, Sidney Silverman in terms yeah. of the death penalty. But in that period from 1964 to late 1967, the three dominant figures in that government were James Callaghan, George Brown and Harold Wilson, both Callaghan and Brown had very serious doubts as to why the government was giving time to things that they didn't think yeah. were the responsibility of government. If Harold had wanted to put a stop to all of it, he could have done it very easily. It was his decision not to do that that actually meant that the reforms Those took place. things happened. Um, we need to talk about Marcia Williams because people can't think of Harold Wilson without thinking about Marcia Williams. Um, it, it, put it into context. I mean, I was sort of when I was reading, I was thinking this is sort of a Dominic Cummings character. Sort of, it's it's more than Alistair Cowley. It wasn't just spin. It was no. he, it was everything that she was involved in in his in his uh, political life. Yes, yeah, she she's a she's a remarkable figure, and I I argue in the book that before Margaret Thatcher, she probably 
came close to the centre of power in number 10 than any other woman, yeah. in my view. Uh, I think that she, she there were certain things she, she gave Harold I think were absolutely vital to him and what he was. And I think the first was the adaptability, Matt, that we've yeah. discussed previously. Who was the person above all that helped him transform from that very formal academic president of the Board of Trade to the person with the popular touch in the early 60s? Yeah. It was Marcia Williams. It was Marcia Williams, the one person he could give her a speech, she'd write rubbish across it. <laughs> and she used to say to him, if I can't understand it, Harold, the public can't understand it, you need to completely rewrite it so people can understand it. She, so she was a big... The second thing she did is, you know, the top politics can be a very lonely place. And what she did was support him with 100% loyalty, even to the extent that when he left in 1976, she, she went with him. Yeah. You know, she stayed, you, you would still find, I mean, people, I interviewed uh, John Tomlinson, who's in the House of Lords, who was Harold's PPS. And he remembered ringing up, I think it was one of the European election campaigns in the 80s, to ring Harold's office, see if Harold would come and campaign for him. Master answered the phone. Yeah. She's still there, still loyal. Yeah. Um, and those two things, I think, that she gave gives him a, a vital to understanding him. But her presence there caused incredible tensions. The, 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 yes. the, the <laughs> most amazing story involving Harold Wilson's doctor, Joe yes. Stone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the, the 1970s government, and I interviewed other members of his inner circle, including, yeah. I was delighted to interview Joe Haynes many Joe times, who yeah, was yeah. his press secretary. Uh, and the 1970s stories of the, the instability, if you like, around Marcy Williams are quite remarkable to the extent that it appears not entirely as a joke that Dr. Stone had suggested she might be, in inverted commas, put down because of the pressure that, that was being brought to bear on Harold. Now, you, you can take that story a, as you wish, one way or another, but that the story is, I think, even told is indicative of the tensions that by then existed. And it's amazing because the story that basically the idea of bumping her off has persisted and has come mm -hmm. from so many sources. The, it, the very fact it was even being discussed is absolutely... Absolutely extraordinary. Um, in a moment, I want to, we'll, we'll talk about what then the Labour Party can uh, can learn. But it's a fascinating book. It's a fascinating chat with you. It's Nick, Nick Thomas Simmons, Labour MP and frontbencher, discussing his book, Howard Wilson, the winner. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss it more next.